Hello my juicy co-creators, Lilu here from the beautiful island of Kauai on the Juicy Living Tour and today with amazing Nassim, I'm so excited we finally meet! Yes, thank you for having me, it's great to meet you! Yes, uh, I'm so excited to speak about all your discoveries and how this is profoundly impacting our whole universe and our way of thinking and behaving and, and um, tell us, because it gets quite complex, I know you've done decades of, uh, decades of research um, and you have the Resonance Foundation project is that right? Yeah, the Resonance Project Foundation. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. And uh, you appear in many movies, and you travel, and you do very exciting work. And, and what I love is that you s you simplify a lot of this science that became so complex. It's so hard for mm -hmm. ordinary people like us to understand. Tell us. Well, actually, I think that um, if a science concept or theory is correct, then it should be simple enough that a seven-year-old should understand it. Nice. Yeah, I think that there's you know, incredible complexity in our world and we can see that in our environment all, all around. But I think that at the foundation of the universal creation um, structure, there is simple and beautiful principles that anybody can understand. Mm. So y you uh, have the scientific evidence to say that we're all one, we're all unified. Can you tell us more about that research that you have and how you came upon that? All right, well, actually, in my latest paper, which is unpublished, it's in peer review right now, it passed the first level of peer review, I'm really excited about it. I actually flushed that out, and it comes out naturally from the equation. I'm not, you know, attempting to make that proof, it's just a proof that comes out directly out of the equations that I've been writing. And um, it's, a, it's equations that are attempting to unify physics. And as a result, it unifies everything, and it's, it's remarkable. And if I was to describe it in simple terms and in an easy way to describe, um, basically, uh, it was found almost 100 years ago that space, the vacuum, the space between things, the space between planets and stars and galaxies, or the space between atoms in a in a molecule or the space inside the atom, which is 99.99999% space, uh, is not empty. It's full. Um, that we're bathing in a fundamental energy that's at the source of all of creation. And actually, this was known by many ancient civilizations all around the world in earlier time. And then was kind of lost through uh, the advancements of physics. And I think we're coming back to it now. Um, realizing that in quantum theory, it's called vacuum fluctuations. And, and when they were discovered, when we tried to analyze how much of these fluctuations, how much energy there was in the space inside the atom, uh, we found that it was infinitely dense with energy, that the vacuum, that space inside the atom is not empty at all, but full of energy. And it might be hard to conceptualize, but maybe an example I could give is like, right around us right now, there's all sorts of, you know, microwaves and radio waves and all this stuff. And we think there's nothing, you know, until we take a radio station, for instance, and tune it in, and then we hear a voice, and we realize, yes, they, there's, you know, radio waves going around, and so on. It's a little bit like that. We look at the vacuum, we look at space, and we think it's empty. Mm -hmm. But in it, embedded in it, is this incredible energy that my theories are starting to show is actually the source of everything, the source of all the material world, which is mostly space. When we're talking about this stuff, you know, all of our material, we're made out of 99.99999% space, and that space is full of all this information. And it is the medium that connects all things. Uh, so for instance, when I, I analyze the amount of energy inside the volume of a proton, which is the nuclear of an atom. It's really, really, really teeny. It's the teeniest little thing. When I, s I analyze how much of this vacuum energy there is there, I find the exact mass of the universe. That is, all the other protons in the universe, all the other atoms in the universe are holographically expressed within one proton, showing that it's all interconnected. So magnificent. So, so 
we are all that every single moment in our life we are connected to all that is there is a way for us to connect to this infinite source of energy we've been separated from it for a long time that's right and when you actually um, uh, look at all the great masters that walked the earth and try to teach us new ways of being and and expand our mind and expand our consciousness they all talked about turning inwards and going towards the singularity towards the center where you know this energy where we could connect with the universe where we could connect you know they might have said with God or you know but it has always been there in so many ancient tradition and you know now I think we're, it's time to write the physics for it and understand how it actually works and then when I did not only did I get the mass of the universe but I can I from the relationship of these vacuum fluctuation on the surface of the proton to the inside vacuum fluctuation I was able to extract an exact solution to gravity I was exact I was ab able to exact extract the exact mass of the standard mass of the proton I was able to extract how many particles there is in our universe how big is our universe what is its energy level how many of our universes there is in a larger one how many of those ones there is in a larger one because now we've got the yardstick now we've got the measuring scale so that we can understand the whole thing because you know this realization that we're actually bathing in a field that connects all things and it's it's holographic and fractal in nature so from analy analyzing a piece appropriately we can understand the whole so so now where do you take this from there because i know you have projects uh, about um and and helping humanity and helping and transforming energy and how we use energy and mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. sustainability i mean mm -hmm. this has a huge impact tell us of the implications that it has on our real day-to-day -day life all your all your work well there's huge implications as we were discussing you know philosophically and spiritually but as well technologically because obviously now if you start to understand that there is an energy available everywhere that makes everything we see now all you got to do is understand how that energy works and then reproduce that in laboratory and all of a sudden you, you would have access to an incredible amount of energy right and it's not like you would be depleting it okay first of all it's extremely large as I said when we first calculated it seemed to be infinitely large but then we renormalize it that that is we use a constant to cut the number so we we'd have a finite number but even when we did that the finite number is 10 to the 93 grams per centimeter cube that is 10 to the 93 grams is like an extremely large number if you if you were to take all the stars in the universe there's billions of stars in all galaxies and we and there's billions of galaxies and you took them all like every atom in the universe and squished them all into a centimeter cube of space can you imagine how dense that would be right mm -hmm. um, well that would be about 10 to the 55th grams per centimeter cube you'd still need to add 39 zeros to that density before you reach the density of the vacuum the the incredible amount of energy that's present so imagine that we tap one tenth of one billionth of a percent of what's there we would have enough energy to run the whole planet for thousands and thousands of years so we're talking you know an incredible source and and not only would we not be depleted because it's a huge source but because when you use it it radiates back into the vacuum so you're just entering the feedback loop of nature that's already there and all you're doing is you know participating with the dynamic of the universe as it works naturally so then your your society becomes harmonious you stop destroying your environment to extract energy um, you know all sorts of applications come from it you can you know if if it's correct and as I'm showing in my equations um, you should be able to create gravitational field so now we're talking space drives we're talking wormhole capability we're talking traveling across the universe I mean a whole new world uh, becomes available to us very very exciting um, 
some of us are awakening in this world, realizing this, realizing how free this energy is from everybody. And we're like, what's been going on? Why have we been separated from that? What have the government been doing? Mm -hmm. What kind of mess are we in, you know, and how mm -hmm. can we get out of it? Mm -hmm. So in, within all of that, like how... This is incredible that it, is it, is it, did some people actually realize this before and it was holded back from us or are we just truly just discovering that on all levels because we've heard of time travel, um, some different projects, some all kind of things have been happening and these amazing projects seems to be suppressed from greed, from money, from institutions. Mm -hmm. What is your whole perception on that? Well, I think there's, well, that's a complex issue and it, it goes all the way back to the Egyptians and the Mayans, the Incas. Um, there's a lot of evidence that there was um, society on this planet prior to our written history, prior to what we know. Um, probably, you know, as old as 10 to 12,000 years ago. Um, and that would have been the end of their cycle. Uh, that was very advanced and that knew of that energy and that knew how to use it and and that might have had direct contact with very advanced beings that you know have discovered this maybe thousands and thousands of years ago on their own planet and have learned how to travel through the universe which is not you know on uh, conceivable I mean if you took us only a hundred years ago uh, we were in horse and buggies, um, you know, they, you wouldn't believe if at the time you would have gone to somebody in a horse, you know, a horse and buggy driver uh, and told him that within a few generations we'd be going to the moon. Um, that would have been very hard to understand for them. Well, you know, there's most likely civilization in our universe. And as we're finding out more and more in astrophysics, uh, there is a lot of evidence that there's most likely a lot of life in our universe everywhere, that the universe is teeming with life. There's most likely civilization that have thousands and thousands of years of advancements on us. And there is evidence that these very ancient civilizations had some contact with very advanced um, civilizations that give them very important information. And they used that information and developed and, and were very successful according to some of the findings we're, um, we're uh, you know, finding out now. Um, and, they, um, and then there was a, a fall. Uh, there was a change. Um, maybe that cycle ended. Uh, there's evidence as well that the Earth goes through cycles of uh, uh, cata cataclysmic destruction. And, you know, and there was the meltdown of the Ice Age and the Great Flood, which is a story that's found in all these ancient civilizations all around the world. And, um, you know, and so there was a fall of this civilization. Maybe, you know, they moved on. Uh, some of them, but certainly there's evidence of their passage. And this evidence is very, very uh, prominent, meaning we're talking not just legends and texts, but as well huge construction, huge buildings that are found all around the world that many of them define, defy anything we could build today with our most advanced technology and that's like straight up facts you know you can do the math and when uh, and and so there's a lot of evidence that there was something very powerful uh, and very advanced uh, going on on our planet um, very very long time ago and that we lost that knowledge yeah. and um, and maybe that was somewhat coordinated uh, and uh, for reasons that have to do with our level of maturity. You know, when you look at our world, when you look at our level of consciousness, when you look at what we do, 
um, you know, all this knowledge actually re-emerged in the 30s, the 20s with Russell and uh, 30s with, you know, um, Tesla and, and all many, many advanced thinkers and researchers have come to conclude that there's this energy and that there must be ways to tap into it and investigate it and got some success in some case to do so. Um, however, our society was not ready. Our society was not in the appropriate place to be able to handle that. Um, you know, there was not really any reason to think that we needed to find new source of energy. We had petrol, you know, and oil. And, you know, at the time it was thought that we were most likely never going to run out, you know, we, and so on. So in general, there was no tension the, the tension necessary to make that happen. However, now is a completely different scenario. Uh -huh. You know, the world is awakening. You know, look at all the manifestations that are going around the world. People are tired of this oppressive, um, you know, a structure that we've constructed for ourselves. And uh, they're wanting the change to happen. And part of that uh, is bringing this new technology, this new understanding, uh, and this new power into the world. And it's, uh, it's an exciting moment. And it's, it's, it can be, we can have uh, some birthing uh, pains, you know, uh, with it. You know, a new being, a new society is trying to emerge. So it can be a little difficult at first, but I think we have a beautiful future yeah. coming along. How much are institutions or government or, or people high up in this old world hierarchy supporting a project like yours? Because there must have been and there must be some projects that we're not aware of that have been developed and some things that have been happening in some other labs that most of the public is not aware of. Have you found out about some things or oh, are yes. you called upon? Are they calling you or is there some things? How is that all evolving on a global scale? Um, yes, there has been many research, underground research. I mean, governments in general have enormous budget for for a black budget uh, organization and so on. So yeah, they they have a lot of that. However, do they have the consciousness to be able to understand the universe at that level? Um, you know, it, it is another question. Um, when when we when we reach that level. Uh, you know, unification is a direct consequences of the mathematics and the theory that you're writing and all this. And so a person that reached that level is going to have a tendency to become humanitarian automatically. And if they don't, they're most likely not going to discover this. And it doesn't really matter how many billions of dollars they have in their laboratory. Uh, so, you know, it's... Been From the point of view of the observer. That's right. I mean, it, it's just... Uh, so, yeah, and, and have they approached me? Yes, I've been approached, you know, throughout the years, um, discreetly, uh, in different ways, by different organizations. Um, I, you know, I'm for the people, with the people. And, uh, you know, I, I'm doing this to deliver it to humanity and this is uh, this is my dharma and I'm not in any way gonna be able to deviate from that. No, no. and you started at a nine years old I read and at a very young age you felt kind of possessed by this but how how were you given would you believe you were given or or like what was the process of this whole discovery was there something that you felt already connected to the universe and you were receiving some information and it's really through hard work and um, yourself being connected to all that is I mean how is this I, I feel like genius happens in those moments of, of really, as you said, of unification. So, yes. there must be, is there some pieces that you have you felt that you have received and that were so clear? It's like, where is this coming from? Well, actually, I, on the genius part, I just I just want to mention that I believe that everybody is a genius. Every born, every baby born is a genius. It's just, you know, society and and the trauma that 
children go through typically within even the first minutes of their birth is is so traumatic that maybe maybe veils come down you know and and so on but uh, for me it's a combination of both it's a combination of ecstatic elimination moments mm -hmm. and a lot of hard work you know I, I've done some 30 years of studies you know, uh, in order to be able to talk physics with the highest spheres of physicists and and in, in, or, in order to write physics and so on but as well in order to have a enough of a, a global understanding of, of science uh, because I felt like it wasn't just specific to physics but I had to understand biology and chemistry and, and all these other things and ancient civilizations and and you know so it demanded a lot of research and uh, you know and so it took a, some time and it took a lot of dedication seven days a week 15 hours a day for many 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 years and that's why you know for a long period of time I was isolated uh, living in a van you know and and that's all I did really uh, for many many years and so yeah it took it was both but it's and it's been a joy all the way through I mean there's certainly difficult moments um, you know especially when I'm rejected by the mainstream or you know I there's like difficult or I'm having difficulty financially to finance the research and there's moments of discouragement However, overall, it's been an amazing, amazing journey and, and so much joy, so much joy to discover and so much joy to see the light turn on in people around me when I teach, when I talk to people, you know, when you see them recognizing the truth and they, and they connect, you know. I'm not saying that it's all the truth, I'm saying, like, you know, they recognize that that singularity is within themselves they feel that connection to the whole that whole thing happen and it's like it's like a lotus opening and you know the eyes light up and i mean that's what keeps me going because it's it's so amazing to see that transformation in a being yeah we can definitely all feel that you have passion for this and so your heart is very involved with it what is the role of the heart and in, in all of this uh, that's a good question. I think the heart is the link, you know, I mean, the, we'll call it the cosmic heart, you know, not necessarily the physical heart, although the physical heart is related to it. Uh, it's the largest electromagnetic field in the body, uh, much larger than the brain and, and so on. And, um, and it's, it's constantly disregarded in terms of what actually it does, either than pumping blood. Um, but, uh, you know, in the theory I'm talking about, um, you know, consciousness is not an epiphenomena of the brain. Uh, you know, it's not happening in the brain. Looking in the brain to look for consciousness is equivalent, as far as I'm concerned, to opening a radio set you know, digging into the, you know, transistors and everything to try to find the announcer. You're not going to find the announcer in there. He's, he's not in there, right? It's just a telephone. It's just, you know, a little resonance device that's, that's uh, capturing, you know, capturing information. And so, uh, you know, consciousness in, in this view is in the vacuum is in the structure of space it's in the space it's in the 99.99999 percent of you which is space and the and the brain is just the telephone is just tuned in to frequencies that are specific to you and that are downloading very specific information that is you <laughs> And so that really, you know, changes the picture. And so when you think of the heart, you can think of maybe the point of singularity, the, the link, you know, uh, that is like that, that connects the information of the vacuum to the, to the body. Uh, you know, you, and, and that link, so is the source of your existence you know I mean literally because you know if the heart stops then I mean the physical heart then 
you know, your physical body is gone. But when the, um, I think that is actually the source of inspiration. I mean, when you get these moments of, a super consciousness uh, these moments of illumination these moments of like feeling connected to the whole these moments where you can feel like you can ask any question and get the answer mm -hmm. right um, I think that's because you have gone so deep into connecting into your heart and then from there the heart inf informs the brain and then the brain starts to work out how to you know, bring that into something that can be transmitted, into something that can be taught, uh, talked about, or something that can be written in a physics equation. That's the role of that part, you know? Um, and, and it's still downloading that information from the vacuum itself, mm -hmm. right? So I see it a completely different way than the current assumptions that's made about the the heart and the brain so would you go into some places i know you surf a lot here yeah. on we're on hawaii that's can right. i uh is that is that one of the things that you do to open your heart or do you have some practices regular practices or? yes i i meditate regularly you have a lovely wife too <laughs> i do that definitely keeps my heart open that will definitely do that and all the challenges that comes with it as well uh and you know, I, 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 I take time to meditate, uh, you know, I mean, um, at this point, I can meditate very rapidly and be in that state. I'm most of the time in that state, even though I'm um, going through my day. But it's so important to take that time every morning and make such a difference because it brings you back to center. And then when you're in center, it's easier to return to it if you kind of lose center throughout your day, which can happen in this world. And, uh, you know, so I, that's really one way that my heart, it's, it's a major way that I keep my heart open. Surfing, you know, absolutely, you know, when you're on this wave and, you know, it's a perfect overhead, you know, slick, glassy, beautiful wave and you're carving it and there's this joy, there's this freedom that, that emerge and that can be wonderful too. Um, However, I do that much more in order to maintain balance in my body mm -hmm. uh, because I do so much work, you know, in, uh, yeah, you know, and, and sitting down at a computer and all this. Uh, I try to keep a balance and that's something that scientists need to do more. I, I feel like if scientists point, spent a good portion of their time doing sports, more scientists did that, uh, it would help them understand the natural world better, be more grounded, be more in the world instead of, you know, in their head or, yeah. yes. Yeah, so such a great, uh, great, great lesson. Thank you for reminding us. I'm so excited about this conversation. I'm so excited that I forget my questions. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> so Juicy, is there something you feel that is important to point out within this conversation right now as we're speaking about this and as people are, are making this shift and, are, and, and, and want to live from the heart and let go of the past? And oh, there, here's a question that I had that um, from one of the conferences that you did over in France regarding like diseases for example what is the implication of what you found like on cancer cells of mm -hmm. people having some uh, terminal diseases well I can't comment on that because I haven't done direct studies that you know I can be confident in I have anecdotal uh, stories but that's not a adequate however um, I think that since there is space in those cells, yes. we could say that we have a much uh, bigger power actually to heal ourselves, don't we? Uh, absolutely. And, and not only that, w um, imagine that uh, all of a sudden you have technologies that makes the structure of the vacuum, that makes the space highly coherent highly available to the biological structure. So now if you walk into that field, all of a sudden your biological structure is getting charged with all this energy that was not available before. And all of a sudden, I mean, you can get 
really remarkable result. And I've seen already from these type of technologies that, you know, instead of um, being detrimental to life, they tend to promote life. Life around these devices grow faster, stronger, better, and so on. Uh, for instance, tests that I've done with plants and, and, and all this stuff. And so, uh, absolutely, I think there's application to health, there's application to longevity uh, that are remarkable. And actually, you know, this might sound a little esoteric, but if you read in ancient civilization many texts um, that describe a moment of initiation with these technologies in the ancient time, um, they talk about the initiate coming back out as semi-god and being able to live forever or to live for 600 years or 800 it's even in the bible yeah. uh, so you know uh, with the ark of the covenant which i believe was one of those ancient devices that survived throughout the ages and so there is definitely application to health and longevity that are remarkable so we're just barely discovering this. I love it, what it involves for, for most of us. You know, this is not mainstream yet, and, and hopefully this video, and I encourage everybody watching to, to share this wildly with all their the, the people around, because this has to come, we have to come to this understanding. What do you think it's going to take to take it mainstream now? Well, I think it's, uh, you know, it's, it's still a long journey for it to be mainstream. Um, you know, many papers have to be written still. Um, however, I think we're on the cusp of this occurring uh, because everything is changing. You see, it's not just our social environment that's changing, but it's literally our environment, like our, um, our uh, biosphere itself is changing. I mean, recently I was looking at all the graphs of all the, you know, er eruptions, volcanic eruptions and earthquakes and the number of casualties due to typhoon and, and hurricane and all this stuff. And all these graphs shows an extreme, uh, you know, increase in the last 10 years, you know, going to acetate at this point. And, you know, um, so there's no doubt there is a fundamental change occurring on our planet and that's driving society to find new solution and to transcend the limitation that we've established for ourselves and so I think it's you know it's in the next few years we're gonna see you know miracles uh -huh. in uh, transformation on our, you know in our society and in our technology things that we can't even conceive yeah possible will become daily usage yeah. for instance you know having a little device in your home that runs your whole house that runs your car that runs everything i mean it's it's yeah. very very uh possible and and it is actually on its way now you know how quickly will we get those how um how much pain, how much suffering, how much difficulties our, our society is going to go through before we make that transition, that's all up to us. Yeah. You know, it's up to you and me and the guy beside us, you know, how many, how, wi how, much, how m willing are we to make those steps, to take the risk, to transform our, our life, you know, um, to stop doing things that are not in line with this higher knowledge, with this transition. I mean, every single person has to make those choices. And if, if people make those choices, every single person that, that make that transition is a huge impact on the whole morphogenetic field of the planet. So every single person counts. Yeah. yeah. What's fantastic is that the, 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 the universe and the field is transforming and we're receiving more and more information. That's how it feels. But it's also up to us to open ourselves. So there is this direct correlation. Is it up to us or the field? Is it, is it, how is that symbiose going to happen? Well, I think that it's both. It's always both. It's a feedback. Yeah. See, more of us open up and change our ways and and uh, transform, more we feed information to the field in which the field can feed us back a reality that matches that. 
And that's why every single person makes a difference. Every single person. And we can create heaven on earth, as Bruce Lipton says. <laughs> absolutely. Right now. <laughs> absolutely. There is absolutely no reason yeah. why. I mean, there is. I mean, Buckminster Fuller in the 60s calculated that if we split the wealth equally, you know, for all people on earth, I can't remember how many millions everybody would have. You know, I, there's abundance. And there is absolutely no reason for one single child to die from hunger, right? It's just a question of organizing our society in collaboration, realizing that we're all one, that we're all on the same boat, and that if we don't take care of each other, we're just not going to make it. Because na natural systems are in harmony with each other. They're not in competition. Yeah, and, you know, you, we saw that earlier in our evolution. Um, when our Earth started, there was monocellular system on our planet. And those monocellular system were in competition with each other. And they produced so much pollutants. And at the time, oxygen was the pollutant. They were eating um, uh, nitrogen. And if, you, if, you know... Uh, um, at the time, if there was, you know, they went almost to extinction mm -hmm. until at the last minute they started to collaborate and they made multi cellular system that all of a sudden, you know, they were uh, able to transcend and they were able to make systems that could breed the pollutant, mm -hmm. <laughs> the oxygen. And that ended, you know, all of our you know biosphere around yeah. and so this is a little bit of a transition that we're in right now yeah and it's and, and it feels like you, you've learned a lot through nature and observing nature and there is those spinning patterns tell us about more the, the spinning uh, theories that you have everything in the universe everything in life is spinning at all times yeah we go a little bit there yeah um, you know it's um, uh, we have to back up a little bit and um, what is the dynamic of this vacuum energy? You know, how does it work? We want to know how it works because if we understand how it works, then we can apply it better. And when you look into it, as I did, I realized that the main mechanical function of this energy is like a fluid. It's like a superfluid. And, um, and it produces vorticular vortices. So when you look at an atom, you're actually looking at a little vortex in the structure of space itself. It's like if you were in water and there was water everywhere. So you didn't know you were in water because it's everywhere. There's nowhere where there's no water. So you don't know that you're in water. And all of a sudden there was a little vortex in the water there where all the molecules in the water everywhere else is kind of random, but there it's organized, you would say, oh, there's something there. And you would think that that is separated from everything else, although it's a function of, this, of the water itself. And so I realized that, and I realized that spin is a very important component. That is, nothing comes to existence if it's not spun into existence. And, you know, there it... it it links with many ancient tradition as well, where they talk about the, I mean, the whirling dervishes and and the the spin of the universe is described in many different ways. Uh, um, you know, the yin yang and all this stuff. And when you, I realized that I'm like, okay, so what are the dynamics of the spin? How does it self-organize? What the, what does the vortices look like? Right? So if there is a spin, then there must be a counter spin. There must be Coriolis effects and all this. And so in my first paper published in physics, I, I amended Einstein's equation that describes space-time by adding spin and Coriolis effect into space-time to describe this dynamic more accurately. And so, yes, uh, this fundamental spin is what is the transducer to creation from the vacuum and so understanding it is crucial whether we're building technology to reproduce it or whether we are in our body 
you know, wanting to link with it at the deeper level, we must understand the spin structure so that we can visualize it, experience them, and go deeper into that vortex. This is, this is the rabbit hole going towards the singularity at the center of our existence, the center of the vortex, where stillness is present. You see? Yeah. And that... Um, that's what we're all doing right now. That's right. That's right. We're, we're discovering that. We're going deeper into ourselves, finding that center, that singularity that stillness that all these great masters talked about yeah. and um, you know and so s deeper you go into that stillness faster the vorticular dynamics of your existence increase mm -hmm. because you can handle it since you're in the center you're in stillness and so you become more and more powerful you start to have a larger and larger influence on the on the you know uh, bioelectric field and of your body and on the morphogenetic field of the whole planet and that's why it's not i get that question often like how many people will it take to you know get the morphogenic field to yeah. go to the next level and it's not a linear equation it's not s simple because some people will have more influence than others yeah. and uh, so it's a little more complex than that I think it could be calculated but I haven't done that yet and you do feel it's gonna happen within the next few years absolutely I, I, you know in the next few years we will either transcend or auto destruct uh, because nature does not sustain a disharmony uh, and uh, systems that are not uh, conducive to expansion. Um, systems that are, um, you know, uh, destructive in nature self-destruct. Um, this is a very simple feedback structure of the universe. You know, you feed it destruction, it will feed back destruction um, so you know are we gonna be able to collaborate are we gonna be able to become one humanity you know striving for the universe are we gonna be able to accept abundance in our world without attachments to you know um, wealth and good and so, you know because wealth is infinite for all beings there's no reason for segregation of wealth. There's no borders. There's no end. Yeah. There's infinite amount of goods in the universe and there's an infinite amount of energy as I'm proving in my equations. There, and we have the capacity to have access to all this. It's just a question, are we going to be abundant in our own consciousness? Oh, and, and abundance in our own consciousness is knowing that there's infinite amount of abundance and I don't need to withhold abundance from my neighbor, from my friend, from my family, from my, you know, from this country over there, um, that like there's solutions that um, where everyone gain, everybody is taken care of and no child um, should suffer and, and, and starve ever again. Thank you, Nassim, for this delicious, juicy conversation that I'm excited to, to share and that I'm sure many people will be excited to share. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your dedication and your work and your, your abundance pa abundant passion itself. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. And keep doing what you're doing. We need people to know out there. Thank you. Much aloha. Much aloha, aloha. from beautiful Common Ground, Kauai. We send you lots of love.